right, everybody, I think we're ready to get started. Thank you for joining us today, Autism, One Parent's Journey. We're thrilled that you're here to hear the perspective of a parent and a practitioner through the ASD lens. So let's go ahead and get started. I am Jess Corinne. I'm head of educational services for Learnfully. I started as a classroom teacher and then I ventured into private practice. I've had experience with many multi-sensory evidence-based programming as a center director and regional manager for Linda Mood Bell and also in private practice. I am so thrilled to facilitate the discussion with our two fantastic panelists, Suchi and Andrea. I'll go ahead and pass the mic to them so they can introduce themselves. Suchi, take it away. Awesome, thank you, Jess. So as Jess mentioned, my name is Suchi. Uh, I am the co-founder and chief product officer at Learnfully. Uh, so I'm a parent of neurodiverse kids. Uh, one of them has uh, autism spectrum disorder and ADHD, and the other one has ADHD. So Learnfully quickly became a passion project uh, to essentially help parents and focus on uh, kids' strengths and interests uh, in order to develop that love for learning uh, instead of being told you know, what they can't do all the time. So Andrea is someone I met through the journey and I'm going to pass the baton on to her and let her introduce herself. Great, thank you, Jess and Suchi. I'm Andrea and I, um... Uh, was a have been a behavior therapist by trade and um, as the years went on 25 years in uh, about about 15 years in became an educational specialist because of the need working with children both with ADHD and um, autism spectrum disorder. So um, the academic and cognitive uh, development came out of the behavior development. No, certainly. Well, I'm so thankful that you're here to share your story with us today. First and foremost, we'll give you a brief overview of Learnfully, although I think you did quite an eloquent job, Suchi, explaining our mission and what we do, but I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit. Um, and then we'll just give a brief broad stroke overview into some key facts regarding ASD. Then we'll open the floor for both Suchi and Andrea to provide their perspective and then hopefully we'll have time for questions. If you have a question along the way, please don't hesitate to drop that in the chat box. And if for some reason we're unable to answer it because we have quite a bit to cover today, we will absolutely circle back with you and ensure that you get the answers that you need. Learnfully is a personalized platform. It's online and it really is there to support learners who learn differently. We have a highly curated network of educational specialists as well as a large breadth of networking and collaborative opportunities beyond our educational specialist network. We are a highly curated content platform as well. We have reinforcement strategies to really make sure that we're gauging each and every learner's needs. We start with a screener to pinpoint where the breakdown is happening. And then we delineate individualized recommendations for multi-sensory evidence-based instruction. We pride ourselves on maintaining proactive communication channels all along the way. So we ensure that parents, caregivers, and collaborators have the information they need to observe their learner, make strides, and observe that progress firsthand. Most importantly, we want to make sure that the learner feels successful and confident all along. So we're constantly reevaluating their goals and to ensure that their needs are being met um, and diversifying the platform thereof. Learnfully is multi-sensory and evidence-based. Through our screening process, we're able to at least look at the learner profile as a whole and be able to gauge their interests, their strengths, and their areas of need. All the while, we, we acknowledge that a learner profile can shift and evolve just like a learning style can, but we target all of our implementation based on these three core senses. And then of course, we encompass all of the other learning styles um, in order to meet the learner's needs and differentiate accordingly. We also ensure that all of our learners have the underlying sensory cognitive function strengthened as a foundation for how to learn, how to process information in an effective and efficient manner. We use the dual coding theory in most of our practicums in order to make sure that our learners take in information and they visualize that information in two simultaneous ways. They either picture the static or the symbol imprint of the word or the numbers or the pattern. And then simultaneously, we want to ensure that they're also able to see the mental representation for the concept and the meaning behind language. 
so that when they, they go to access language, whether it be oral or written, they have that framework, that visual mental representation to stand upon in both component subskills. Some key facts before we open up the floor for the discussion. I think, you know, these facts are, are present throughout my research, but I, I completely respect and understand that they're ever changing and it's really hard to find one source of truth. Um, so quite often when you do research online for ASD and um, autism spectrum disorder as a whole, we recognize that some of these facts are, are not necessarily true. I mean, they are always changing and always adapting based on um, new research and such. So at this point in time, based on the National Autism Association, we find that autism affects or at least has been diagnosed in one in 54 children. Um, there, it's usually diagnosed, they can say there's some early indicators uh, before around infancy, before school age, um, but primarily this number encompasses eight and older. Um, we think one of the misnomers is that boys are more likely to have the diagnosis, but in reality, symptoms present differently. When you know, when you've met or know one learner with ASD, you've met or know one learner with ASD because everyone does present differently. Um, so we find it's a great disservice for the, the girls of this population because their symptoms present differently. Um, but at this point in time, based on diagnostic evidence, boys are at four times more likely to receive the diagnosis. It doesn't mean they're four times more likely to, to actually warrant it. Um, so as we know, it's the fastest growing dis disorder as well. Um, and I think that not necessarily it's fastest growing, but we find more research every day, day in and day out, there's more evidence and research to, to substantiate the need for the diagnosis, but the diagnosis has been a, long, a lot longer than the research. Um, so I think that's really important to note. Going forward, we want to ensure that we give the, the opportunity and the time that you each deserve to talk through the, the journey from your lens. So I'm going to just go ahead and throw some questions out there, starting with this one. First and foremost, I'd love to hear from Suchi. If you don't mind sharing that initial diagnostic process with us, we would be so greatly appreciative. Yeah, not at all. Uh, so this is, uh, just wanna put it out there that everyone has a different journey. Uh, you know, they have different pain points, different forms of support. So what I'm uh, doing is drawing from my own experience, uh, but what I have found is that many parents go through the same phases, which is, you know, initially we were in a little bit of denial. We were like, oh no, it's just a speech delay or yeah, I think, you know, he's probably just not understanding something, especially when things are so great. It's really hard uh, as a parent to even admit that, admit that to ourselves that, oh my God, because the society has painted autism as like such a bad thing that, you know, it's really hard for us to accept that. In fact, um, and then of course we get on the list, you know, we try to, um, you know, now we're like trying to get, okay, let's figure out what's going on. And they're like, okay, you got to wait for like six months to a year to get an appointment. Um, the reality is we're very fortunate that we had resources to go in right away but even then, like the ways the doctor handled it, it was just very disheartening. Like, you know, the way they said it, it just wasn't great. Um, fortunately, um, you know, we had a private practitioner, uh, you know, we had an appointment with her the week after and she didn't tell us anything different, but essentially what she said was, look, you know, he's three, you know, you can't really do an IQ test now. I've taught him something now, he picked it up quickly. So, you know, don't worry, just go get these services and, you know, let's check back. And that was just such a different message. And the lesson over there is that uh, people really don't take the parents' emotions or feelings or, you know, what they're going through into, you know, into consideration, uh, which is a real bummer because, you know, we need to be well to essentially move forward and get, you know, our child the right services. And of course, from that point on, all they tell you is, here's your problem, go figure out what the solution is. Then it's still up to the parents to call the insurance, figure out behavior therapists, et cetera. That's another whole process. And then fast forward, they're in school. You, you think that things are settled, but you know, it changes like every year because their goals change every year. And then in school, there's all these like new terms that you learn and this executive functioning and you, your kid can read but can't comprehend. And it's just like all mind boggling. So the point is that this is a tough journey for parents if they don't have the right resources. 
uh, but with the right resources, uh, and we were very fortunate to uh, come across one, even with all our resources, it wasn't like easy. A lot of it was trial and error. But the second we found one, we latched onto her and you're looking at her right now, that's Andrea. And the process just became so seamless. Uh, but that's mostly because we really needed to talk to someone who treated our kid like a kid and not a business. And so that's why it's very, very important to find the right resources, uh, you know, who can essentially be honest with you and give you a very objective view of, uh, you know, what your child is capable of. So, sorry, that was longer than- Oh, you know. no, that was great, Suchi. No, thank you so much. And it almost is the, it's the perfect segue into how did you find the right team for your learner? Because we absolutely respect and recognize the fact that it takes a dynamic team that meets the learner at their level and, and can differentiate and engage with that learner. So how did you find Andrea? So, you know, that's, so like you said, right team, right? So it was Andrea, but it was also a lot of other resources. It could be support. It, it's your spouse. It's, it's your parents. It's your kids. It's your friends, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, one thing I do say is that uh, trust your intuition. It's, you know, one thing that I've always believed is that my kid is great, he's smart, and, and it, it was really important for me to be logical and not necessarily get emotional. So that means if someone is saying, hey, your kid can't do this, it's like, I had to ask myself, okay, so what? Like, he can't button a shirt. Okay, so what? But what, are, what can he do? So it was really important to find people who believed in that who believe that, you know, these are your son's strengths, like, you know, we can totally make a program based on this, and who also supported you and your family. So um, it was not easy. Uh, it was a lot of trial and error. But like I said, but once we did it, we lashed onto them like no one's business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my son's made tremendous gains as a result of that. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Andrea, I would love to hear from you as a practitioner, especially one who has personal experience with Suchi's journey. How do you formulate a plan? So she finds you, right? And then what's your next step in the process? Right. So I think um, it's, it's, uh, that's such a great question. It's kind of a loaded question. So I'm going to, I'm going to truncate it as best I can. But um, you know, my first steps, and they don't go in chronological order, but they, you know, when I first meet a child, and I, I do this with the family, is I assess where the child is developmentally and not necessarily where they are in the chronological age, um, but they where they are in a developmental age, and I meet them right where they are. I find out where their interests are and their strengths are, and we launch it from there, right? Um, and I, I, I know I'm a piece of the pie. I'm not the whole thing. So I collaborate with the team that is in place as quickly and as thoroughly as possible. And I try and integrate what the team is already doing into the program that I am um, putting in place. Um, and, um, and then I pri prioritize goals. We can't do everything all at once. So I prioritize what are the most important goals? But most importantly, I think I communicate and I work mm -hmm. with the family um, in not only prioritizing goals, but working with them in what is most important to them and what mm -hmm. they think they can do with their child. Absolutely agree. I think it is so important. It just speaks to the high level of quality communication, right? Not only do you need quality instruction, of course, and the right team, but having that collaborative nature and being able to have free flowing communication between all parties really ensures success and trust, right? So I, I think that's amazing. And I, I can, can probably guarantee that's one of the reasons why you guys clicked and hit it off as you both share that view. And that's I think great. what Gucci's saying is she learned that this was very doable and it is. Mm -hmm. And you instill that, that um, notion, right? That feeling of success and confidence in every, every player of the team, right? Not just the learner, but the family as a whole yeah. and seeing their, seeing their potential and helping the learner then realize the potential 
yes. is what I'm hearing. So that's, that's awesome. Well, Thanks for well, also, uh, just to give an example, some of the things that were really nice about communicating with Andrea is this was our first kid. And so mm. we don't even know what's normal right? and what's not. So having that perspective was very important, especially because, uh, you know, BCBAs, especially who are fresh out of college, uh, not everyone, uh, in our experience, they tended to uh, over uh, focus, if you will, on like certain things like, oh, you know, Syria is too interested in uh, space. And we're like, and, and, and we were like, oh my God, what do we do? Like, you know, he's too interested in like one topic. And then Andrea is like, yeah, that's what he's going to be, a specialist. And we're like, course like you know what else would it be so um you know it's just a trait like that's it like he's a smart kid he hyper fixates on history and you know he gets good grades uh and and that's what it is it's it's just another trait and another funny thing was that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree you know so i apparently had undiagnosed adhd and I even make fun of my uh, husband sometimes because, you know, it's like he'll be looking for his keys or something. And I think after my son got diagnosed, I'm like, oh, that's what it is. So our marriage actually improved uh, as a result of that, because now there was like an understanding of it. So what was normal before is just our kids are going through it in a very different way. And, you know, yeah. we just take that for granted. So you know, once we had that realization, like, you know, we were at peace with each other. I, I love that, that perspective, right? We're always talking about taking perspective and having a clear view. And I hear you at the beginning of the journey, it's the stress fog kind of flows in um, just based on the delivery and the, the lack of knowledge and awareness. And once you have the heightened perspective from the team too, um, I think it's so key and can keep you moving on a positive path. Which well, is Honestly, it's the lack of confidence because as mm -hmm. a parent, it doesn't matter how confident of a person you are or how objective you are. You tend to second guess every decision that's being made, especially when it comes to your child because sure. it's time, right? And you mm -hmm. won't get that right back. So, you know, having that level of confidence, all that, as you said, the stress fog, all that comes with time. Um, and uh, so a lot of parents do get very anxious, like a, a lot of ASD parents with new diagnosis tend to think about regressions, right? Mm -hmm. And then often, uh, you know, teachers tend to jump on that, like, oh my God, he used to do this and, and now he's, he's doing this. But then here's the difference between a good and an, experience, uh, an experienced team, and a, uh, you know, is that when we would bring this up, you know, they would go observe and they'd be like, he's doing it for attention because the other kids are getting attention. He's not getting attention. It is not a regression. So like we just like get into flight or fight mode. Mm -hmm. And I think over time you learn to sort of, you know, calm down and, and accept your new normal. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just it's, it's life. Like that's all it is. And so uh, I think we can all get there. Uh, it's a lot of work as Andrea said, but it's like having kids. It's so worth mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that, that's really helpful to hear and just to take your perspective and be able to take a step back, you know, and I think we're all feeling, you know, a little, little heightened stress these days with kids at home and such and everything that's going on, but to know that there is a, you see the end in sight, which is very helpful. Um, so let's turn, turn over a little bit more to Andrea. I'd like to hear from you how you maximize the learner's experience. You know, we take perspective, we set goals. How do you ensure heightened levels of engagement and attention as you're working with learners with ASD? So, um, you know, I usually, uh, like you said, it is different with every child. Um, I do... Um, need to lock in um, a self-regulation um, type of um, feedback for them throughout the session. And that can be tricky because that can involve either a sensory break or a sensation throughout the session. It depends on the child. So I use, um, I'm just going to touch on a couple, but it doesn't mean um everything for everyone. So I use things like thinking putty, um, gum. Lots of times I, I call them crunchies where they have a little bowl of something to crunch on 
during a specific task that might be um, not their favorite. Um, whole body listening is usually good. Let me see your eyes, that type of thing. Turn up your ears, clear the space. Don't clear the space. <laughs> um, I do have one child who likes to put his hex bug. I don't know if everyone knows what that is, but it's a vibrating little bug just on his fingers right after he writes. And it feels wonderful. He knows he can do that. And it's just great. So things they can look forward to after they finish something. And it's just um, wonderful. A, a visual schedule. Always, 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 always. So we always know what we're transitioning to. Always, always. And it usually is something we want to do, something we don't want to do, something we want to do, something we don't want to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Alternate to motivate, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And lots of big smiles. Yay! <laughs> lots of oh, cheers. We'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Andrea, I think you're being very humble in terms of your ability to establish a connection too. Can you speak to that a little bit? <laughs> well, um, it is, there is a rhythm and I've always said it is, it does have to go up and down throughout every session, right? And so you, um, you want to bring it up, but not too high. So you're self-regulating and, um, uh, this has just been a real uh, thing with ASD. You keep you keep things up so that they stay engaged, and then you bring it down a little bit down so they can keep self regulating. And that is the way to stay engaged throughout every session. So you monitor the pace. You monitor the pace. You monitor the pace. Yes. I so appreciate that. I think I need a session with you sometimes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I need to monitor my pace. Um. <laughs> that connection, you know, Andrea does have that special genuine ability to connect with kids. So yep. uh, the lesson here is it doesn't matter even if you're getting a PhD with, with 10 PhDs, uh, you know, if they don't connect with your kid, they're not going to make progress. That's exactly so that's right. something that I've definitely learned as a parent. I can, you can throw money at the best resource, but it's who can connect with your kid uh, and who does your kid respond to. Right. And by incorporating their interests and strengths, it can, of course, right, increase credibility and trust so that you can establish rapport in more of an expedited fashion. So I absolutely agree. Um, I want to allow time for the last couple of questions. I hope it's okay to, to, to move on. Um, how important is it, Suji and Andrea, I think you both can speak to this. How important is it to take care of yourself through the process? I think, you know, as a parent myself, self-care can go out the window as I'm prioritizing my own children. So I'd love to just hear briefly from each of you, how important is that to you? Uh, I can go first. So very important. Uh, but then that being said, it's sort of a double-edged sword, right? Like mm -hmm. we don't have the time for self-care. And if we take the time for self-care, there's 10 other things that we're not doing. So we tend to not prioritize that. So uh, this is very common, like in the beginning, uh, especially when parents, you know, moms, dads feel like, no, we can, we're the only ones who can take care of this kid. If I don't do this, then my kid's going to struggle. But the reality is the more you go through those cycles, you're just going to explode and it's not going to be a good experience for your family. So mm -hmm. we, we need to be okay with telling ourselves that this is my list. I'm only going to get this done. That's fine. Like what are the most important things? And one of them has to be self-care. And, you know, to me, self-care is just putting headphones on and watching Netflix. Like it could just be that self-care could be, okay, you know, I do want to go work out. It's whatever gives you energy and whatever mm -hmm. makes, whatever makes you happy. So, uh, take the time for yourself. Uh, this is very hard, especially for parents, you know, who are passionate and, and love to help their kids and feel like doing that will somehow fail their kids. But take it from me, the reality is, if you don't do that, mm -hmm. it is not, you know, as, as Andrea said, you know, we also ebb and flow. And when it crashes, it's going to be a really bad crash. Mm -hmm. So um, find a way to do it. It's not the easiest thing, but it's the most important thing. I fully agree. And I'm sure you'd back her up on that, Andrea, as well. 
that, you know, we have to be our best selves to be our best parent for our kids. You know, we have to ensure that we're taking care of ourselves to, to be there for them. So I completely, completely agree. Um, since we're closing soon, if we could speak to this point, uh, that I think it's really important to at least mention, what is something that you wish you knew before starting the journey, Suchi? What is the one thing, and I'm sure it's really hard to name just one thing you wish you knew, but if you could, what would it be and why? Um, yeah, there are many things, right? But mm -hmm. the one thing um, I think I wish I knew about the about this journey is I know this is uh, again it's hard. Uh, it's like having a kid. Um, is that the amount of anxiety that you know came with it? Um, like especially initially was really uh, I don't want to say not needed, but it was just very very important for us to take perspective of the situation and not necessarily, uh, you know, fill our heads with worst case scenario, if you know what I mean. So um, one thing that was very important, which could also go hand in hand with self-care is uh, cutting people out who are toxic. So mm. if you feel like they're stressing you out more, whether it's family or friends, uh, uh, not getting rid of them, but, but choosing how much information to share with them was uh, very, very important for us. We fortunately had supportive uh, family and friends, but you know, there were a few that I, mm -hmm. you know, that we just couldn't do it all. Um, and so we just need to be okay with that. Um, so that essentially is something I wish I knew is to be okay with focusing on uh, what's important to you. And prioritizing that. Yeah, yeah, and I'd just like to piggyback on that. I think that, um, if I could, I've often told a lot of families that I work with, if I could, you know, have a time machine and just bring you into three years from the initial mm. diagnosis and show you how well everything is going to come out, I, I, I would, but you have to trust me on this. It's going to come out and all of those, so much of that worry and convolutedness is just going to fall away if you could know that now just a mm. little bit it yeah. might make the road a lot a lot easier yeah um if you don't mind i'd like to add one more thing i completely agree with andrea and uh to uh, basically add on to that is what she again came to us with was this is what your kid can do while we were hearing, this is what your kid cannot do. Like mm -hmm. we heard that so much that we were fixated on fixing these issues. It's like, so what if he's at 50% at buttoning shirts? I think that's that's enough, you know, that's, that's not a big deal. Uh, but we really took the time to even uh, get him enrolled in interests that are strength-based. So I could tell that piano was something or music was something you would be good at. Uh, you know, people don't advertise that, oh, you know, uh, we, we don't take kids on the spectrum or something of that sort. But if you call them and say, hey, my kid's on the spectrum, can he come in? Every single one of them has said, bring them in. Karate, mm -hmm. piano. So definitely focus on their strengths and what you believe in. And, and the community is more than willing to help. Don't hold them back uh, if you uh, feel like they can excel in a certain area. Absolutely. And Peggy O'Meara's quote comes to mind is that, you know, your voice becomes your child's inner voice. Right. And so you both parent and practitioner are setting the example, but also helping them take perspective on what they can do yeah. and instilling that mindset and seeing their ability, their capability and realizing their potential is groundbreaking. It's everything. Yeah. Right? I think uh, his speech therapist said it best. Like basically she said that your kid's going to meet the bar that we set for him. Absolutely. So if he set a low bar, he's going to meet that. If he set a high bar, he's going to meet that. Okay. Um, so, you know, just don't like, you know, feel like they're less than or something. It's just, they they have significant strengths uh, and they have significant weaknesses too. Sure. Yeah. Focus on the strengths, you know, the Absolutely. weaknesses may or may not matter uh, as time goes on. Phenomenal. Thank you both for sharing your stories. I am so grateful that we had the chance to share this with our community as well. Um, as we mentioned, we always take in perspective our parents and collaborate, collaborators um, 
lens and to ensure that we're meeting our learners needs we do start with the questionnaire so a lot of these these questions can be captured there that you shared with us suchi um, and then again we go into a screening process and ensure that we're making recommendations for instruction um, so these are this is all information that you can find on our website it's, it's very important that we provide personalized attention to our students based on their instructional needs and that can vary that can evolve and shift like you both have said that we could start with the plan and then it might change based on their reception activity and their goals. And so we might find a learner that needs intensive remediation to really strengthen the underlying foundation, but then they can move on to something like enrichment where we're targeting specific skills like social skills, executive functioning, writing essays, study skills, and so forth. Um, and some learners honestly might even sideswipe both those steps and move right into something that's really um, take it to the next level and front loading and previewing what's to come in the years to follow. So we have a three tier instructional plan that you can absolutely find more information about on our website. Um, but I really think it's it's important to note that we we value your your vulnerability and we appreciate you sharing your story with us. I think it's going to help quite a few members of our community. So thank you both so, so much. Absolutely. We're very grateful. And for those questions that we didn't answer, we promise we'll circle back with you. But I think now's our time. We appreciate awesome. everybody for coming and close. Thank you so much for being here. Hope to Thank see you again soon.